just as we uh, gather here, right? we all have a past. <laughs> all of us have a past. I'm going to share some of my past with you tonight. I want you to keep that quiet just between us, will you please? <laughs> Many years ago, Elaine and I used to be chicken farmers, amongst other things. We had a mixed farm, and on that farm we used to grow chickens for a, a large national company. And I remember lots of things happened during that time. I, I want to encourage you with this. There were 20 chicken growers in that particular group that I was with, 20 of us. And one, we used to have a serviceman come around most weeks to just check on the uh, quality of the stock, see how they were going, health of the stock and, uh, and management conditions and that sort of thing, just to check. And one of the servicemen said to me one time, he said, you wouldn't believe that there are 20 different ways to grow a chicken, but they all end up the same. Now, you know, when I, when I say that, this is what I'm saying, that many of us have different journeys in life. But if our focus is on Jesus, we're going to end up the same. Amen. I think there's a real strength in that. That's not what I want to tell you tonight. Back in those chicken growing days, one of the servicemen who came around, he was quite a, a lovely guy actually, and he had a, a, a faith, a, just a, a, it was a growing faith, and we had lots of conversations. <clears throat> and he spoke quite often about his manager who was, I think, um, I got on board with him, he was a man of faith as well. But we didn't see him very often, but there was a bit of friction between the two. I think that's probably the best way of saying it. Well, it happened that this company, as lots of major companies uh, do, they, they had a bit of a shake-up amongst their staff. Now, this fellow who used to visit the farm every week um, lost his job. He was a bit distressed, a bit disappointed. But, you know, as it would be, Within a week, he had another position in another company, very similar, but actually a step up. So he was actually, he came out of it really well. Well, life went along and we had a new serviceman come around. And it wasn't very long, and there was another big shake up in the company. And this overall manager lost his position. And he was without a position, without a job for a long time. Why am I telling you this? Well, he eventually got a new job. Guess who his boss was? <laughs> you can guess, can't you? His old employee was now his new boss. I tell you, don't ever burn bridges. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, I'm talking about... You'll get it in a moment. There's, I've never seen it, but I, I saw the title the other day of a movie called Reversal of Fortune. Reversal of Fortune. I can't tell you what it's about, but I saw that title and thought, that's what I'm talking about this week. Let me read to you from the scriptures and you'll get the picture straight away. I'm actually reading from Luke chapter 18, picking it up at verse 9 through to 14. <clears throat> this is the story of the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, if you haven't already worked it out. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. Now the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you God that I'm not a sinner like everybody else, for I don't cheat, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead he beat his chest in sorrow saying, Oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love that reading. 
I guess a lot of the scriptures, but, and I know that you do as well. You know, it's not going to take much of a brain to work out where I'm going tonight, if you think about it. Is this message for you and for me? Yes! It's for us. This is to the people who got this message, just to remind us that if we trust in ourselves, we're not going anywhere. You see, there are these two people that Jesus highlights in the temple. This Pharisee, and when we talk about Pharisees, we, we sort of scorn them a bit. We say, oh, not another Pharisee. And we've been speaking about Pharisees a little bit lately. It's, it's not a, a dig at the Pharisees. The Pharisees were actually lovely, goodly, good living people. They adhere to the law. There were probably only a couple of thousand of them, they say, in all of Israel, maybe a few more. <clears throat> but they, they were godly living people. They get a bit of a bad rap in the New Testament. But this, this guy, he was, he was probably right at the top of the tree. The scriptures say he fasted twice a week. The law said you had to fast once a year on the Day of Atonement. But he was there every week fasting religiously. Now, I'm not a real keen fanatic on the word religion. I think I've said that to you before. Religion is trying to do all the right things to earn your way to God. That doesn't work. I've said to you before that religion is trying to do those right things, trying to earn your way to God. But you know, through Jesus in Christianity, God comes to us. <laughs> And that's the big difference. But as we look at this parable of this Pharisee and this tax collector, I'm going to tonight use the word religion a few times. But just to keep it in context, this man was religious. He kept the law. He did everything right. So as he walked into the temple and began to pray, people were standing there in awe of him. They knew he was a good man. Was he a good man? Did you hear what he said to God? Actually, in some versions of the scriptures, it says this, that he prayed to himself. It doesn't say it in the New Living Translation, it just said he prayed. But in some versions of the scriptures, it says he prayed to himself. He was patting himself on the back, saying this, God, you are so lucky to have a man like me come before you, to come into your presence. I fast, I go over there and put my tithes in the offering bowl every week, I never miss, I'm here, I never miss coming to church, I'm out doing good things, I'm doing everything according to the rules and regulations that are before me, right back through the law, he knew the law intimately, and he kept those laws. Didn't break a law. Was he right in what he was saying? Yes, he was a good man. Yes, people were there watching him. Was he a good role model? I'll leave that up to you to decide that. On the outside, he looked as though he was on the road to heaven. He looked as though he was heading in the right direction. He looked as though he had it made. He knew where he was going. He had a relationship with God because he told God all about how good he was. And you know, quite a few of the commentators say this, that he probably had people gathering around him, clapping him as he prayed. You know, he was a good prayer. And they would have said, yes, he is a good man. Yes, he does these things. Yes, he's on the road to heaven. When he dies, we know where he's going. And then we get this other fellow. This, we could put a lot of adjectives in there, but the scriptures say this despised tax collector. This cheat. This crook. And what does he do? You know, it's almost as though the crowd would cheer when they saw this good man, this Pharisee, come in. But what would they do when they saw the, I've got to say it again, tax collector come in? 
You can almost hear the boo and the hisses, can't you? We know what he's like. He shouldn't even be here. He shouldn't be in this place. He doesn't deserve to be here. What was his prayer? Lord, forgive me. For I'm a sinner. I've messed up in my life. Boo! Yes, yes. He's speaking the truth there. We know how he's messed up. He's made a big, big, big mistake. The crowd heard what he prayed and they were in agreement with him. And then he says this, Lord, forgive me. For I'm, this is not his exact words, but you can read it in there, I'm the chief sinner of all times. I'm as bad as it gets. But I've come to you tonight for mercy. Let's just stop there and think about this for a moment. The crowd agreed with the Pharisee. Yes, he was good. They agreed with the tax collector. Yes, he was bad. But what does Jesus say? This is a, a we can only call it a paradox, I think. The paradox is, is something that's not what you expect it to be. So Jesus is saying the good man comes in and goes out bad. The bad man comes in and goes out good. Does that make sense to you? Well, it does when you understand how loving our God is. That we don't get into, we don't come into relationship except by the grace of God into our lives. Who went home justified? Well, the scriptures say that the Pharisee went home still in his sin. The tax collector went home justified. How can that be? Who is this God? Who is this God who says, your sins are forgiven? This fellow over here doesn't deserve that. If you actually dig in, and look at that scripture, which we're not going to dig in too much, because you'd be here all night, because I can speak for hours on this subject. There's a big word, I don't like using big words, but it's called propitiation. Anyone heard of it? You see, going back in the Old Testament, there was this, if you like, box, about a metre long, about a half a metre wide, that contained the tablets of the Lord. Do you remember what it's called? The yeah. no, Ark of Covenant. Yeah. And so the tablets, the laws were written and they were placed in this box. Over this box were two cherubim, that's angels, not real ones, but uh, statues. And the, the Jewish people took it with them. They, they believed that the presence of God was there in this place. And to be propitiated is a hard word to say even for me. For any of us, means this. Let me go back another step. You see, the priest in those days used to go into the Holy of Holies one day a year on the Day of Atonement, as it happened. And he would go into the Holy of Holies where this Ark of the Covenant, Covenant stood, and he would sprinkle blood over the Ark, the blood of a lamb, and that would. I suppose, come before God and God would say, the sins of the people are taken away for this year. It had to happen regularly. But you see, this fellow, can I say it again, this tax collector, was calling on God to make him right by the blood that was sprinkled over those tablets, over that uh, Ark of the Covenant. He was saying to God, I'm not worthy, but because you do that by your whole your high priest, I can be worthy. But of course, Jesus is now, in the New Testament, his blood is sprinkled. His blood was given for us. 
so that we are now free, we are propitiated. <coughs> Am I explaining that well enough for you to understand what I'm talking about? Because when we grasp this, we have an understanding of who our God is. That he would send his only son into the world, that whoever believes in him and accepts the sacrifice, his death upon the cross, his resurrection, that's what sets us free. We are propitiated. I hope I'm saying that right. The blood is sprinkled for us. You see, this tax collector was saying, God, when you look at me, don't look at my sin. Look at the blood that's sprinkled over me. And when God looked at him, he did, God looked at him sin in anger. You can read that in a number of scriptures. God does not like sin. Sin separates us from God. The scriptures remind us in Romans, all have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious ideal. Even if we just fall short a little bit. I heard a preacher one day say, well, I was a bit concerned about some of the things he was saying, but he said, oh, look, I, I did sin when I was younger, but these days I'm right. I don't sin anymore. And I thought, well, <laughs> because I don't know who we are. Sin is not always the things that we do, but sometimes it's the things that we don't do. Sin creeps in, it's insidious. All of us have sinned and keep on sinning. That's why each day we need to come before God and just seek forgiveness. We need to repent before Him. Because it is that sin that separates us from God. So this tax collector was, he really had a right. When he realised that there was nothing that he could do himself. There was nothing he could bring before God. This this Pharisee, he was commending himself before God. God, you're so, you're so lucky to have me. I'm on your side. I'm perfect. I'm living a life that you must be proud of. And he commended himself. He was right. He had to live that life. But it didn't make him right with God. He hadn't committed adultery. He hadn't cheated. He hadn't stopped. All those things. He was living it right. Whereas this fellow, this this tax collector, well, he had messed up, but he had the heart to come before God in repentance. And you know, friends, this story is pretty powerful. If you think it doesn't apply to us, I'm going to ask you to think again because we all can fall into that trap of pride. We all can fall into that trap of thinking, I'm going all right. I'm okay. It's everyone else that's the problem. You ever feel like that? <laughs> we all feel like that sometimes. But the reality is that all have sinned. All, all means everyone, have fallen short of God's glory as I do. And one of the biggest stumbling blocks for many of us is pride. You see, that was the stumbling block for this Pharisee. He thought that he had it all together. In part, he did. But because he thought he was so good, he probably looked down his nose at everyone else. Particularly that, I'm going to say it again, that tax collector. We know what he was like. And I'll remind you again of what Jesus said. This man went home justified. Whereas this man went home still in his sin. So what's the, who's this message for? Well, I think as you listen to this message, I just want to remind you who this message was, was for. Jesus told the story to someone who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. When we understand who Jesus was speaking to, that we begin to get a picture of what the story is about. The story is about those who have great confidence in themselves, who think they've got their act together, who think that they're living the right life, a good life, a perfect life before God. They're trying to do all the right things, earning their way to God. For it's by grace that we're saved through faith. 
It's nothing that we do. This, I won't say it again, but this fellow over here, he didn't earn his way to heaven because he was good. He earned it because of the grace of God that was poured into his life. Do you know, I think that gives us hope. It means that every one of us can come before God and confess our sin. Every one of us, no matter who, is welcome. But can we receive? If we think that we're good enough on our own, we're never going to be good enough. It's just not going to work. So this message is for you and for me and for all who would seek to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. This message is for us. This message is pretty plain, really. We're never going to make it on our own, no matter how good we are. But the bigger sinner that we are, as big a sinner as we might be, doesn't really matter. God's grace is sufficient for us all. This is good news for sinners. I think as you reflect on this, there are probably a lot of people in the day of Jesus who thought that they had it made. Not just the Pharisees, but many of the others. They thought that they were doing all the right things and that they were saved. I think there's a problem with that in our world as well. I don't think anything's changed. A lot of people think, I love it. In fact, I had a conversation with a guy this week. And I won't tell you what it was about, but he simply said to me, I was helping someone, and he said, Oh, you've got an extra brownie point today. You're going to make heaven because you've been so good in this circle, under these circumstances. But I said, It doesn't work that way. I don't think he understood what I was talking about. And I didn't have time to explain it, but I will. I'll meet him again. We need to share the gospel message with those around us. What's the gospel message? What's John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's good news. Nothing else to do with it. Doesn't matter how much good we do. Oh, by the way, don't stop being good people. <laughs> That's important. Keep up, keep up the good works. Because but good works without faith is dead. I think when the Lord touches our heart, two things happen. Our hands go into our pockets and we have compulsion to give. I found that. I've discovered that. But more than that, we have a compulsion to help those around us and to be faithful in our ministry. But that's not what saves us. It's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. His blood sprinkled over our lives that brings us into relationship with God. You see, God looks upon our life. He doesn't see the mess, the sin, the grot. He sees Jesus. And suddenly we're able to go home justified. What's justified mean? Just as if I'd never sinned. Amen. Just as if I'd never sinned. So that's good news for us tonight. What does that mean for you this week? Well, it means this. As you go out into the world, out into your mission field, out to be as Christ in this community and beyond, wherever you might live, you don't go out on your own. You go out as Jesus. You go out sharing with people, encouraging people, knowing that without Jesus, you are nothing. You're propitiated. You better look that word up. I might have a pronunciation slightly wrong. My voice is a bit croaky tonight. But just don't listen to what I'm saying or how I'm saying it. Listen to what the scriptures are saying. That God loves you so much. That he gave Jesus to you. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus.
Jesus. We thank you that in and through him we can come into your presence. Not because of who we are, not because of what we've done or haven't done, but because of who Jesus is. When you look at us, you don't see us, you see Jesus. His blood covers us. His blood makes us clean. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. And as we go into our week this week, we just ask your blessing to be upon us in our comings and our goings and those divine appointments that you have planned for us. May we be constantly aware that we're not there on our own, but that you are with us. That you are present there in your Holy Spirit, empowering us, giving us courage and strength, giving us the right words to say at the right moment. You're speaking into our lives and speaking through our lives. Father, we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the love of God and the presence of his Holy Spirit, be with us tonight and forevermore. Amen. We go out with a charge. We go out with a challenge. We go out with Jesus. Be blessed.